Hello world, welcome to the Breakout Finder podcast. I'm your host, Nate Liss. You can find me on Twitter at an outraged Jew. And with me, as always, is Mr. Ryan Lopes. You can find him on Twitter at stillryan5. And tonight, back with us once again, I believe, for the second time, the legend and one of the originals with the Breakout Finder, Mr. Russell Clay. You can find him on Twitter at Russell J. Clay, coming to us live from a racket back. court. Russell, how's it going? It's very roomy in my apartment, and Nate is... If you see his left eyebrow twitching, that's <laughs> because that's because of me. Um, so if you notice next week, he posts a YouTube video and there's just a little twitch in that eyebrow. It's, that's because of this podcast he recorded with me. I know, and man, I apologize. Like I said to you before, I'm fucking <laughs> skin is crawling right now. <laughs> This is very difficult for me, Russ. You came to us tonight, and I know you're going to deliver, though. So, like, I'm not concerned about your audio quality because Russell Clay is a notorious fantasy football analyst, one of the best around. And, look, Russ, it feels like just yesterday you were cresting 10,000 followers on Twitter, and here you are, over 11.5. Just unbelievable, man. You, you, Your climb, your ascendance has just been – it's brought a tear to my eye. He's hot. He's uh, hot. Uh, Russ, Ru- Russ a hot boy right now, Nate. Uh, I'm a I'm a elite coxman, as they say, of the oh fantasy football gosh. world. I, are... <laughs> no one says that. I Not one person has ever. ever said that. I mean, somebody. I mean, I guess if we scrub the whole internet, it's a big internet. Uh, one person heard... probably told him that before. <laughs> I heard that on a podcast. I think it was Sylvester Stallone was dis- either describing someone as that or he he was a coxman in wow. the Hollywood industry. Wow, so anyway. Incredible. No, I mean, I'm learning, I'm learning new stuff all the time. I, I have heard the phrase coxman before, so you're, you're not alone in that sense, Russ. I'm, I'm fine with it. And Russ, it, it, you are, you're always willing to get on the show, but we don't have you on enough. I know the fans love you, and, and again, you were one of the originators of the Breakout Finder. I mean, when... Every time I type out the words breakout finder, like you pop in my head and hopefully tonight we can address a couple of things because uh, Twitter is embattled. There are there are debates taking place across the Twitter sphere about uh, who people played with, uh, you know, whether dynamic score matters, all these things revolving around it. And you are one of the originals. You know what went into this. You know what you and I sat down and talked about and what we felt like mm. were some of the most important factors in evaluating or at least putting context <clears throat> to what a player did in their collegiate profile. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But, Russ, right off the bat, let's talk about Super Bowl traditions, plans, traditions. What mm-hmm. are you doing? What do you do? Are you just going to be playing racquetball all Super Bowl Sunday? What are you going to be doing? <laughs> and and I just want to throw out there that my Twitter timeline is purely Danny B. Kelly tweets, Ryan quote tweets of things that I tend to laugh at, and, and Nate lists YouTube videos, and then, you know, Sully football's back on Twitter. So Sully's back, dude. So know. good for all of us. I, I've, been, I've been hyped about that, but... You know, there's just a sea of muted tweets and and accounts out there for me. And it's just all clear right now unless I click on unmute this comment. So, I love it. Yeah, you you, uh, you know, I haven't taken full shots fired. Well, yeah. And, you know, I haven't taken advantage of the of the mute tweet ability. That's something that I should do because the trolls are coming, you know, more and more every time. We tweet something, there's some guy with a wart on the end of his nose crawling out from under a bridge, and he's he's trying to come <laughs> after the tweet. And I'm not going to put up with it anymore, Russ. We're firing back in 2020, okay? We're, put, we're, okay. we're puffing out our chest in 2020. So Super Bowl traditions, Russ, are you doing anything on Super Bowl Sunday at all? Okay, so a tradition of mine is generally, and I say generally because uh, there's a variety of chips that I eat. <laughs> and I just always, I always eat too many of yep. them. And by, several, you have an assortment of chips on Super Bowl Sunday. A, a hint of lime is a main contributor to my okay. light, my lightheaded and groggy feeling around. You it's know, the most washed up thing I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. 
This is great. <laughs> you ate too many uh, chips, so you're, you're groggy. Go to Whole Foods and eat their pizza and then just feel like trash. And, okay. you know, that's pretty much my Super Bowl Sundays nowadays. That's, that so. sounds like one of the most top three <laughs> depressing things. Uh, what's generally perceived as a fun day of drinks and excessive food and friends, family, laughter, perhaps. Russ is binging on hints of lime Tostitos chips mm. and falling asleep at, at Whole Foods buffet counter is what I gathered from I mean, all that. And and Kam- Kamaro Usman highlight tapes. Oh, there you go. Because, okay. Russ, yeah. are you making it, you making it to halftime at all? Like, I mean, do you are you making it through the full <laughs> game or are you just like carb load and then pass out? <laughs> Not quite pass out, but shift to the bed and the lap type, laptop creaked open, yeah. you know, yeah. when it's not fully and you, you just have it enough so it doesn't close. Right. It hurts to lay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. So many bags and chips. Ryan, what about you? What do you, what do, you do? I, uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily too far behind, Rusty, but I've, I've never, like, uh, I've never found myself at a Whole Foods, you know, binging on their pizza, but uh, I, I tend not to make it past halftime. I'm more of, like, I'll fall asleep before mm. or right after half, um, unless the game is, like, super enthralling, which I think we might have a pretty good game mm. on our hands on Sunday. Um, but I am a big, um, I'm a big buffalo chicken dip oh. guy. Um, you could, you could dip it with Tostitos chips, carrots, celery boys, uh, maybe mm, pretzels if mm. you want to get crazy. Big buffalo chicken dip guy um, and and lots of water. Wow, lots of celery. Salt shit. Lot, dude, celery? Fantastic. I love celery. Who doesn't wow. like celery? Very progressive yeah, of you. Wow. Well, yeah. I, I, I mean, I... How about you eat chips like yeah, a man? Yeah, what in the world? <laughs> I, I, the first thing I said was Tostitos chips. What are you, an herbivore? Here's the thing. They're not, they're not yeah. hint of lime, but they're, they're the good. The first thing I do when I host a Super Bowl Sunday and somebody brings the platter of vegetables is I open the top of it and I dump it in the trash. I immediately <laughs> get rid of it, get it out of the house because... That's not welcome. We're not, if you want to bring your vegan food in my house, you put that thing right in the trash can because that's where it's going. Look... I'm, I want chips. I want ribs. I want, you know, a bean dip, a triple cheese bean dip. I want to feel it in my chest by halftime. Does anyone eat? I've never heard anyone actually eat bean dip. I think that's like a cartoon no, that's a, uh, dish. That, that's bro. the thing. Like, I want to get to halftime and not be sure if it's indigestion or a heart attack. That's how I want yeah. my day to go, Russ. That's great, bro. We we've covered, we've managed to cover all three different kind of spectrums here. We got Russ passing out. We got we got Nate passing wind, and we got your boy like I'm kind of in the middle, I guess. Celery was was an offensive thing you to bring to the table, water I suppose. And celery, <laughs> I, bro. Your it's boy's so got. I, I don't. It's a lot of salt. I wanna I wanna get the salt. That's what what out I would eat body. if I was on like a stranded Cutter desert white. island, and like all I could find was grass and water. That's what I would eat. But on Super Bowl Sunday. With Pat Mahomes Bean dip. facing Bean Jimmy dip. Garoppolo, the next most fraudulent quarterback of all time. I still don't think he's any good. We're going to find out. It's yet to be determined. Yet to be determined. Uh, listen, Ryan, Russ, yeah. I'm looking at this show sheet. Uh, Ryan has added some things in here. One of the things that he has added to this show sheet, I have personally experienced at least three times. Luckily, not that many, but every time Upset. it stings a ton. Ryan. You walked that. into the gym and mm, got yeah, in there and realized today. you had no. no headphones. Is this true? Mm. Bro, I walked in. I I checked. Uh, I checked the checked the hoodie pocket. I did one of the. I did like one of the things. Check check the check the short pockets. And I and I in the middle of the gym, I, I kind of just leaned back and put the head. I'm like, I, I I think people around me they they knew like ah the kid she just his headphones are gone, and it's one of those. It's it's a pivotal moment in life, boys, where you, you're you're caught. You know, luckily the gym, my my local gym, I'm only I'm less than ten minutes away from it. That's that's an easy ride home. But mm-hmm. out of pride, mm. I'm I'm at the gym oh. already. You know what I mean? I, so this time, and I will say, um, you know, this has happened to me uh, probably probably less frequent than Nate. I'm, this might this might be the first time this oh happened my. to me in like in like ten years, um, and I was so upset. 
and I stayed and it was the longest hour and a half of my entire life. You hear, you hear people's conversations. You cannot concentrate. People are making the weirdest noise. And then I'm, then I'm, then I'm self-conscious. Like, damn, do I sound like that guy that like that girl? Do, do I, do I sound like these people when I'm doing my thing? Um, so I'm listening to shit. All the gym music is just mm-hmm. terrible. It's just, it's just, it's just a bad time. So, I, and I was surprised. Everyone in my mentions, obviously, said you have to turn around, you have to go home. And I'm like, I'm in the middle of doing my thing already. So, um, so terrible, terrible look. Don't ever do that. Um, that's 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 what I wanted yeah. to get out there. Just a little little little, little that's, PSA. That's no good. I mean, I I didn't know. I left my headphones, like I said, on two or three occasions, and I didn't realize how bad the gym music was. You know, they're playing like. We Terrible. built this city like every other song, and I'm like, listen, I can't. I'm not gonna work out to this. Russ, are you are you at the racquetball court right now at Russ at his gym? <laughs> now let let me get before we address the racquetball court <laughs> of of which there is one at my apartment complex. You're but in first it. of all, I have two questions. Number right. one. Ryan, did you go to your car mm-hmm. and how thorough of a check for headphones did you do? Because there could be headphones underneath you're your right. driver's side seat right now. You're, a- you're absolutely right. And I thought, I thought, you know, the last time this happened, nine, ten years ago, I'm like, I know I stashed some shit in the, uh, in the right. glove box. There's something there. Open that up, nothing. Just a bunch of old ass Starbucks napkins Perfect. staring at me. Just I impressed. was going to say, there's uh, that one, that one Snickers like just, bar wrapper that's half ripped because you ate it depressing. out of pain <laughs> there's no yeah. there's nothing there i i probably ate that last time i forgot my shit crying in the car um i did i did do a check uh came up with mm. nothing did the sad walk mm. back inside the gym so everyone's like this kid left because he went to look for it he came back empty-handed now he's like a loser twice over he's still here though so i kind of respect him um, and I kind of just went about my business. So, uh, yeah, just a really troublesome, you know, beginning, beginning for me there. And, and number two, <laughs> mm. was there a man mm-hmm. by the water fountain in relatively decent mm. shape, weird, like almost, um, like weird shorts. They're not, they're not like, and one shorts or anything. Okay. They're, they're like gray, you know, those okay. gray, like almost cut off sweatpants. I'm following, shorts. I'm following. And, and was he talking to a gal 15 years younger than her <laughs> in a flirty way? Uh, there was, uh, everyone, I, I will, I will say, uh, my, everyone in my gym is, is pretty focused dude they there's really okay. not a lot of chit chat that goes on there from what i've seen again i'm i'm you know I, you, you go to the gym and everyone has their hours like i'm at the gym the same time more or less monday through friday get out of work it's the same we're all like the the six to eight kind of crew whatever there um so i see the same faces uh, more often than not and everyone again kind of clocks in and does their thing there's not a whole lot of side conversation i haven't seen my boy in the gray fake and one shorts talking to someone he shouldn't be talking to but i will rusty i will keep an eye out for him in the future because it sounds like i gotta be i gotta be aware of these people i gotta, I gotta be mindful of these people correct yeah that guy's me russ i'm in a pair of fila shorts <laughs> post it up outside the daycare just doing one too many laps in the parking waiting. lot i'm like oh dang hey do we go to high school together She's like, I'm 40? I'm like, uh, Stop talking I'm to me. I'm not sure if I'm 40. Speaking of 40, though, Russ, speaking of 40, Drew Brees, he's pushing 40, right? Is he, is he in that? Is he over 40? I think he's got to be over 40. 41. Listen, let, let's talk about this because this is a hot topic for some people. Um, in a post Drew Brees era, which has been, uh, some light has been shined on here recently because Russell Wilson gave up his starting spot in the Pro Bowl to Drew Brees, which has started a rumor that maybe Russell Wilson is aware of the fact that Drew Brees is going to step away from football in the coming year. We don't know that for sure. But every time this conversation starts, the question arises, what happens to Michael Thomas post-Drew Brees? Russ, in a world that is Drew Breesless, what happens to good Michael Thomas? I guess good Michael Thomas now, right? Well, let's first address that I projected the the fall of Drew Brees last off season, and I traded Michael Thomas last off season. So Ballsy. Ballsy. we're we learned we learned a hard lesson last off season. <laughs> oh we about, we as in just Russell Clay <laughs> yeah, about trading Michael Thomas. 
Um, I thought he looked great in that stretch with Teddy Bridgewater. I, I don't, I, I wouldn't move him at all. Uh, the only issue for him is him and Devontae Adams are sort of in that mid range now where they're 26, 27, you know, that's their prime. But, uh, you know, a few more years, we're going to be looking 28, 29, and then the community is going to start to sour on their dynasty value. So that's, that's kind of what you're thinking about with Michael Thomas, but, I think he's just ride him till it's it's over type guy. I it, he just played too well with with Bridgewater this year for me to fade him I now. Love it, Ryan, yeah, his, his his hands. I mean, if they're not the best, they're top two or three in the league. I mean, he just yep. he just doesn't drop um, anything. He's like DeAndre Hopkins um, in that sense. Uh, so I think, um, and again, like like Russ, you said that 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 stretch with with, with Teddy Bridgewater. It's only in a, a one of the quarterback sample size. There's talks of Taysom Hill being that guy in New Orleans, but I I think Mike Thomas is pretty. It has to be talent wise, man. He has to be one of the more quarterback proof players. Um, so I'm I'm with Russie. I'm not I'm not at all worried about about moving off him, and he has to be um, you know as close to consensus you know dynasty wide receiver one as there is right now. So safe safe a uh, hold for me. And Nato. I'll hit you with some quick stats here. <clears throat> Bridgewater started six games in 2019. In his first three starts, all three games, under 200 pass yards, two total touchdowns amongst those games. The next three games, every game over 240 pass yards, seven total touchdowns. In those six games with Bridgewater from weeks two to seven, Michael Thomas finished with five top 15 finishes, and two of those were top five. So, unbelievable. even if it's Steady Bridgewater... Decent. Don't do what Russ did. Do <laughs> yeah. not sell him. Russ, you're not selling Michael Thomas. You learn from your mistake. Here's a chance for redemption. Ball's in your court, literally because you're in a racquetball court. <laughs> Kenny Galladay, if a new wide receiver lands, lands, in Detroit, God, lands in Detroit, is there? should we be concerned for Kenny Galladay? Let, let's say they add a receiver like Chenault. Or another dynamic sort of you know big stretch playmaker, are we concerned for Kenny Galladay? I I actually think there's a case to be made for Galladay as a top five wide mm. receiver in 2019. Mm. Not wow. not in terms of overall future talent, overall dynasty <laughs> value. In terms of what he put on the field in 2019, I thought it could have been a top five wide receiver season. 18 yards per reception, played the last eight games with just an absolute joke of a, of a starting quarterback crew and still produced. He still produced, and it was – it was incredible. Um, it wasn't quite Michael Thomas with Bridgewater, but he had huge games and he'd have like two catches and it'd be like huge contested catch for 50 yards at the end of the game. So um, I think he is absolutely, you know, a, a great wide receiver. Um, what that means for dynasty value, I don't know. Um, but I think barring injury, he's going to be producing like this for the next couple of years. Ryan, what do you got? I know. Yeah, I know, Russ, you mentioned you don't you don't know kind of dynasty wise. But out of curiosity, do you do you do you have a rough idea of where you would rank him? Is he a, I know you mentioned maybe a top five ceiling as far as, you know, redraft season Town. long. Yeah. So like, is, is he in is he in like that top? top 5 10 range for you is he more in that 15 20 uh give give the good listeners an idea of kind of where you would value him um even with the idea like like Nate said hypothetically Detroit does go wide receiver you know kind of early to mid round we're in a really weird spot with dynasty leagues right now where the second tier beyond Michael Thomas, Devonte Adams and Hopkins it's like a crazy crazy big tier to like 20 you know i i kind of view all those guys in a in a big Mismash. I'd say right around 10 is where I'd have him. And in okay. terms of rookie picks, because that's kind of how I tend to look at things, 103. I mean, I'd probably want Jonathan Taylor and, and Dobbins over him. But beyond that, probably 103. So here's a question, Russ, for you. <clears throat> when we look at Kenny Galladay um, and we look at his market share since he's been in the league, or, or you know, more specifically, we look at Kenny Galladay um, over the past two seasons uh, that he's been in the NFL. He's been in the NFL three years now. Kenny Galladay's target share has been outside the top 24 <clears throat> over the past two years. 
Um, in 2018, he was the wide receiver 24. That's with a full 16 games of Matt Stafford. That's in his sophomore year. Then this year, obviously, we lose Matt Stafford for majority of the year. The, the passing game takes a nosedive, and he ends up the wide receiver 33 in terms of target share at 21%. And back last year, when he was with Stafford for the entirety of the year and he finished as a wide receiver 24 in target share, that was when the Detroit Lions ranked number 11 in pass attempts overall in the season. So my question is, with players like Devontae Adams getting 30% target share, or even guys like Cortland Sutton on, on low pass volume in the 26-27% target share range, are you concerned buying Kenny Galladay that he'll never he'll never reach a ceiling beyond sort of the targets that we've seen out of him which are around 116 I am not worried about that only because we saw what he could be in that first half um so weeks one through nine were all with Matthew Stafford this year and he was let me check it right now he was WR9 in points per game, and he had one, two, three, <clears throat> four games with, with 23 PPR points or more. Um, he was a very, very good wide receiver one. So, no, I'm not worried about that. I think he's clearly their featured guy. Um, also, Marvin Jones is getting older, so I think we could start to see his production creator even more i think he's going to be fine he's going to be like vincent jackson basically he's not going to have 150 170 targets but uh 120 targets 130 targets a year i think is pretty reasonable i love it we 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 talk about situations changing all the time situations changing for the better for the worse if uh, there, i swear there was a rumor somewhere about St the, that the lions possibly mm -hmm. walking away from stafford or moving on wh whatever it was but the lions could be stafford at staffordless next year Russie. i mean that's that's got to be that's got to factor in somewhere here. Yeah. I mean, and that and that's why when I hear, you know, top 10 for Galladay dynasty wise, um, I 100 percent agree with all your, with what you're saying talent wise. But um, I can't help but think about situation and kind of to me that that's got to knock him down because I think, again, you're absolutely right with that, that kind of crowded middle middle tier there. That's got to knock him down towards the bottom of that tier, I think, despite the talent. I mean. Stafford without Stafford that's a that's a pretty scary proposition and given what they have coaching staff wise and you know they're going to want to run the ball we talk about Ty Johnson all this stuff I mean it could it could get ugly for for Kenny pretty pretty quickly fair um I I don't worry about situation as much as others but it could be an ugly 2020 it could be if rough. they're rocking Andy Dalton or something like that yikes yeah. so similar to the first question Russ when we talked about Michael Thomas in a post Drew Brees era we've got two boys in Tampa Bay in Mike Evans and Chris Godwin two very very different players and we've got Jameis Winston we don't know that Jameis Winston comes back to Tampa Bay. Um, I, I really don't. We really don't know if, if that happens. But if Jameis Winston does not come back to Tampa Bay, <laughs> and you've got Chris Godwin and Mike Evans still there, are you concerned about one, both, neither? I, I'm bitter. I'm a bitter Chris Godwin person. Did you, did you trade Godwin early too or something? No, I didn't get any shares. Yikes, and okay. uh, it wasn't like I was low on him, but there was just someone higher in every yeah. league. And I just watched him become an elite player this year, and I just hate it. So <laughs> that's that's my take on that, and that's no further questions. Perfect. Ryan. <laughs> I um, Yeah, we might have been last, last show or two weeks ago, three weeks ago, but we – I mean, I – fully it might have been the show with brad actually i sat i, I raised my hand i mean i think we were both in agreement nate you and i godwin's a, a top two three dynasty wide receiver for us um rusty shaking his head as well i think it's and again uh it's a little bitter for rusty but i think talent wise he's there um we just talked about the situation in detroit matthew stafford leaving changing the guard at quarterback um the Jameis, the Jameis roller coaster this past year was so much fun uh so frustrating at times but so much fun because arians just lets the guy just air it out no matter what yeah you roll out throw two or three picks to start the game just keep firing 
you know, it, it doesn't matter. And uh, I'm not sure what happens if he doesn't come back. I don't know where Arians goes. I imagine maybe he tacks on a vet of sort of, I can't, I'm not sure I picture Arians with the, with a super, super young guy, a rookie, whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I, I'd be a little, I'd be a little down um, if it wasn't Jameis just, just having the free will just to just keep airing things out. But um, again, I think, I think it's one of those situations, especially in the case of Chris Godwin, age and talent, you got to keep riding with 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 pure pure talent there and just hope the situation kind of evolves and tailors itself and kind of works out in that sense so i'd be really hard pressed to move on from godwin even if even if Jameis wasn't um on the controls in 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 2020 i mean and and we've talked about this before but i i think godwin could thrive under most quarterback play but for evans i think we truly need a passer that's willing to take risks because he's not a separator he's an inefficient pass catcher but he makes big contested catches and he's decent after the catch. And I've mentioned this before, but Mike Evans has broken 140 season long targets one time in four years. So, you know, when you, when you look at, when you look at him and you look at his upside and you look at his inefficiencies, I'm way more concerned about Mike Evans in a post, you know, Jameis Winston era. And and in terms of Chris Godwin, for all the people that have been ranking Tyreek Hill as the number two wide receiver in Dynasty, clearly you you forgot who Chris Godwin is because Chris Godwin has to be way up on the top of this list, way up on the top of this list. And, And if Chris Godwin is underrated, Russ, how underrated is Robert Woods? Uh, let let me just throw one more thing out there while Nate was talking. I I started to think of the rumor that Philip Rivers kind of might go to Tampa. And there's like this weird, I'll bring up Vincent Jackson for the second time in this podcast, wow. which has to be a record for the last four yep. years. Um, shout out Northern Colorado. But um, <laughs> Vincent Jackson is, is a lot like Mike Evans. Um, and I think, you know, if Rivers goes there, he could use him in a much lower target role than what Evans had this year. So I, I tend to agree with uh, that take. And yeah, Robin Hood Woods, baby. Mm, your um, this is him and Golden <laughs> Tate have been my guys for the last three or four years. And, um, you know, they're kind of always peren- perennially underrated in Dynasty. And I'm just. I'm just going to keep riding them. You know, I, I don't know when the show's going to end. Woods is like 28, I believe. Um, so he probably only has a few more years left. But, you know, that's what we thought about Golden Tate. And he just kept on chugging. Um, and had he had a full season this year, he would have produced another year as well. So, yeah, Woods is just a, a really good wide receiver and a great system for fantasy. And, um you know, produced really well despite the lack of touchdowns. Him and him and Mike Williams basically tried to break records for yardage without touchdowns this year. <laughs> I want to um I want to list off some names that I'm seeing uh you know ranked somewhat consistently above Woods, um, Russie and Nate. Let's look at your, your your take here on a couple of these guys as well. So Russie, you you tell me if you're taking these guys um, before Woods or if Woods truly is being undervalued in these situations. Some names that I'm talking about, some names that I'm seeing. Um, I see Tyler Boyd. I see Julio Jones. I see Keenan Allen. Um, I see his teammate Cooper Cup um, above Robert Woods. Um, and the last one I want to throw out at, out at you, um, Christian Kirk. Ooh, okay. Nice. So those, all those guys currently, for, for the most part, from what I've seen, different different dynasty services, those guys are all ranked consistently above Robert Woods. Any of those names stand out where you would, you know, no-brainer, I want Robert Woods above Kirk, Jones, whoever it may be? I'm, I'm actually kind of in alignment with, with that general view. Um, Woods does have that age issue is the only problem where he's careening towards the, the win now um, value guy, mm-hmm. kind of like Jarvis Landry as well, where I, I know they're going to produce for more years, <clears throat> but they're going to be on your roster. They're, you can't trade them anymore. So that's kind of where I'm at with Woods. I wouldn't be buying, uh, but if I have them, I'm definitely not selling. Are you, are you shocked to hear that Robert Woods finished the year number eight in total targets and number two overall in yards after the catch? I mean, it's a guy that's Fantastic. 28 years old, and he's still putting up monster numbers. If nothing else, like Russ said, this is this is your your low, you know, cost 
veteran that's going to carry you across the finish line that you can buy for a lot less than guys that are younger producing similarly. I mean, Robert Woods in this offense could have another two solid years. I mean, possibly more depending on how things shake out. I mean, Brandon Cooks is not the same player. We watched Cooper Cup go from a target machine to a, a much more limited role, but a touchdown machine. That guy scored a touchdown every game across like the final six weeks of the year, which was mind bending. So Robert Woods looked like the de facto number one it, uh, for the Rams here for majority of this season. And the numbers kind of reflect it. But exactly like Russ said, if you own him or if you buy him, he's probably going to die on your roster. But if you can get your hands mm. on him at, at a discounted rate and he's your wide receiver three and he's producing like a wide receiver two, you know, even a one on some weeks, I mean, that, that's how you win leagues. That's how you win leagues, Russ. Um, let's, look, let's look at the next thing here. Uh, this is a, a good question. I believe Ryan probably put this in here. <clears throat> I didn't put anything in here, to be honest with you. This is unfortunate. It's an unfortunate <laughs> week for me, Russ. I was not prepared. Um, what, what, who is your favorite or obvious dynasty buy or dynasty sell? Yeah, um, it's Nikhil Harry, and it's not even close. I'm trying to go get him everywhere. Um, he, he started the, the year. The breakout fighter doesn't lie. He started the year on IR, and he came back, and they were slowly trying to acclimate him. He started playing the freaking, you know, Chiefs and Titans and all these tough defenses, and, you know, he struggled, and they started using him on end arounds and stuff. The athleticism is there. He was doing it. He was scoring touchdowns, but um, he, wasn't, he wasn't ready yet, and he's 21, and he was a first-round pick, and he had everything I looked for in a prospect. And now, I mean, I'm seeing him being traded for late first, mm. and I will do that. He was my 101 last year, and I just don't give up that quick. I know there's some people that say, you know, after year one, the odds drop if they didn't break out, like hogwash. Um, <laughs> I don't give a shit, dude. Um, I'm <laughs> Going all in How do you on use Harry. Hogwash and say you don't give a oh. shit. Man. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have him in every league. I love basically, it. by the end of this year, kind of like Devonte Parker was, except that took much longer than appreciated. But we made it, baby. But, but we made it. So it's kind of like you know, I don't know when the breakout's coming. It could take another year or two, but I, I know it's gonna happen unless it's Corey Coleman and he just gets cut next year. So there we go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, man, I, Nate. This is this is kind of this is kind of your wheelhouse, man. Pe- you've been blessing the people with uh, weekly, um, you know, dynasty buys, sells, all that stuff. You're just you're out here navigating entire rosters, man. I want I want to defer to you, buddy. Who do you got um, that you either wrote about before, or maybe someone new that's kind of popped in your head over the past? I've few never days? wrote about this guy, written about this guy. Sorry, geez, what you, what era is this? Uh I don't read good. Um, I've I have not written about this player, but he is constantly on my brain. Because I have Leonard Fournette ranked higher than him. And this player has recently showed out, and I've seen ridiculous graphic tweets that say, is Derrick Henry the fantasy football 101? Here's my thoughts on Derrick Henry. He's coming off one of the most incredible playoff runs we've ever seen. I mean, and over the last couple, you know, ever since the transition to Ryan Tannehill, he's looked like an entirely different player uh, from what we saw early in his career. But if someone is offering you an absurd deal, I'm taking it. If there's somebody out there that's going to give me Miles Sanders and a 2021st for Derrick Henry or or whatever I can get out of it, I'm going to do it because year to year, touchdowns are the most unpredictable stat that we've seen. And if you want evidence of that, go look at Alvin Kamara from 2018 to 2019. We watched him go from 18 season-long touchdowns to just six this Mm -hmm. year. And then here we go again. Derrick Henry is sitting at 18 touchdowns on the season while also boasting less season-long receptions than Patrick Laird, who played half the amount of games. Don't we play PPR? (laughs) I do. Do you play PPR? Everyone's nodding. Everyone nods their head in in agreement. Sell Derrick Henry. I like the talent, but boy, you can get a lot for him right now. Good take. God, I like thank it you so much, yeah. man. We should play racquetball. Um, listen, <laughs> Russ, 
You are you are constantly <laughs> on the grind. You do Dynasty. You're into Devi. Um, you're you're a champion of the people. But the the Kansas mm. City Chiefs need a running back, and they need a 2020 running back. Is that true? And and if if that is true, who's the running back that you would like to see land in this Patrick Mahomes Andy Reid offense? You, you know that crying kitten meme, and it says, please say psych. Yeah. You know, the, the, the kitten with the tears yes. in their eyes. That was me when, when Travis Etienne uh. went back to school for his final season. And I wanted that. I wanted him to go to Kansas City so badly. And uh, I, ever since he has done that, I just I haven't been able to get past that he won't be on Kansas City in 2020 and I mean that's kind of my answer I'd like DeAndre Swift as well but ETN would have ran for seven Mm. yards per carry Mm. in Kansas City's offense so bummer yeah ETN definitely had the speed element I know um you know the the Niners defensive coordinator basically said the 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 Chiefs just trot out an Olympic team, Olympic track team, uh, whenever they show up to your stadium. So big on speed there. I've always kind of pegged uh, Swift as that perfect fit in that offense, just given the pass catching ability. You know, Russ kind of mm-hmm. hinted at it. So so Swift has always been my kind of my kind of fit. I know a lot of people were kind of banging the table for that for that e- ETM pairing too. But obviously we gotta we gotta wait a year until until he blesses us on Sundays. But Rusty, didn't you have a tweet, bro, about um, you had you had something about ETN and you had that it, it was some sort of little video clip about uh, the AFC West about how uh, that dude was like I love it or I hate it yeah. but I love it <laughs> that shit was perfect for it too Yeah, uh, um, the, West, the West would have been a mess with, with ETN and the Chiefs man just running all over the place Thank you. I thank you for the tweet appreciation, Ryan. I I I, I, I appreciate I appreciate good tweets. I mean, I and, and Russ, I, so I did actually put this question together. Now, now that I'm looking at it, I remember because <laughs> this I, is just your I one question. I recently released a whole new segment over on Patreon, and, and it's called Breakout Finder TV, and it's where I'm going to do a 45 to 60 minute podcast slash video where I, I break down a ton of Dynasty and Debbie things and just things that are on my brain, right? Like, I, I'm going to go over the top a little bit. I'm going to give you that energy that you need in your life. And I talked about the Kansas City Chiefs need a running back in the 2020 class. And one of the things when I was digging into the the information was about Andy Reid, right? We remember him playing, or we remember him as the head coach in Philadelphia from 1999 to 2012. And then since then, in 2013 to present day, he's been the head coach in Kansas City. But in 21 years of coaching, the running backs, the, the running backs that are pass catchers, and there are still running backs in this class that, that fit that bill. We got J.K. Dobbins, we got Cam Akers, some names that, that could fall in there. Looking at the players mm. that he's drafted, right? LaShawn McCoy, second round pick. Uh, I believe Brian Westbrook, third round pick. But in his 21 years, yep. five running backs exceeded 60 targets, four running backs <coughs> exceeded 80 targets, three running backs exceeded 100 targets and Jamal Charles missed 60 targets by one target in 2014 because he played 15 games so more than half of Andy Reid's career he's had guys that are targeted over 60 times and and if you exclude the the Sharkandrick West Spencer Ware Deuce Staley Darnell Autry these these guys that just didn't have it necessarily it's Wow, it's probably what a way pull. higher, right? Like it, it could be three quarters <laughs> of his career running backs have had over sixty targets. So it's like any running back that goes to Kansas City that fits the Andy Reid, uh, you know, play calling style and, and offensive scheme is gonna be a hit. And they're not gonna take a first round running back. There's a chance that they take a guy in the second or the third. He's done it in the past, and if he finds that guy that fits the bill, how highly should we covet that running back versus maybe the other one, two, mm-hmm. or three running backs that go above him? It's a great question, and I think you're you're dead on in your assessment of Andy Reid and sort of the running backs he likes and where he likes them. Charles was a, a third rounder. Westbrook was a third rounder. McCoy was a second rounder. Um, and you know that's Kareem Hunt yes. was a third rounder. You know that's the that's the thing, and that's why like when you see DeAndre Swift in the in the first round, I don't necessarily think that. Um, but if he slips to early second and they trade up for him or something like that, it, you just say Kansas City running back 
22 years old, um, top three round draft pick. That's got to be a top seven mm. dynasty running back. I don't even care who it is. Just fill in the blank. And that is top seven, top eight guy. Yeah. It just has to be. So did we did we spend all offseason last uh, last year arguing about Darwin Thompson for absolutely nothing like Darwin like no yes. one no one cares about Darwin Thompson okay he, fair he right. didn't and okay. he didn't have the profile but like Russ is saying I I truly do believe that if if Andy Reid gets his hands on the right running back and if you look at his draft history it is very successful if he gets his hands on the right running back in this class then he could absolutely finish as a top 10 fantasy football running back by the end of his rookie season. I completely believe it because we even saw Kareem Hunt finish with the rushing title. You know, we saw Jamal Charles be the wide, you know, the running back one overall when he played. And Brian Westbrook had numerous top 10 finishes. And LaShawn McCoy, numerous top 10 finishes. So we've seen it before. So it, it should be something that excites us, Russ. Um, Here's another another rookie that we should be very excited about. Jalen Rieger. Let's talk about a landing spot. How high should we be on him? And in his range of outcomes, mm. could he be a wide receiver one? Mm. Um, you know, okay, I'll do another meme. You know, Magic Johnson, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> that's that's what, that's me with Jalen Rieger, man. I don't I, – I, 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 I respect it. Great athlete, but the profile is not there for me right now. Does have interesting um, stuff, and if he runs a four three like we expect, then I'll, I'll definitely be interested. I'm never going to be as high as everyone else. Um, that doesn't mean I think he's bad. That just means I'm lower than consensus, and I don't know. I I see second, third round right now, and probably third round, um, and that's still high praise. It's just. I don't see the first rounder that that is, um, you know, I just don't think he had enough receiving production to get kind of that that hype. Where do you where do you where do you want to see him land on Sundays, Russie? If he uh, even if you know what, what, whatever round he gets picked in, mm. what environment do you want him? Like, there's a lot to be said about you know the way he was deployed at TCU, just utilized yes. mainly out of the slot. I think personally, he can do a lot more. Um, again, athletically, um, just overall ability as a route runner, route runner at the next level. I think I think we're going to see that unlocked. Hopefully, it's 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 with the right offense and in, in the right offense. What would that offense be for you? I'd love for Aaron Rodgers to get a Randall Cobb again or oh, some guy who can be athletic. And I mean, I think Rodgers has definitely regressed, but I also think he doesn't have Apex Jordy Nelson and Apex Randall Cobb anymore. Yeah. And if you were to That'll get a, a Rieger, um, you know, who can get separation and get open for him, I, I'd love that. Nate, you had a. Uh, I think. I think you. You might have. You might have hinted at uh, an interesting landing spot for for Rieger, or maybe one that you wrote up, but you weren't too keen on. Do you want to? Do you want to let? I mean, the cat out of the bag. I. I was interested in the idea of of Rieger ending up in Miami. I feel like Miami has the picks. Miami needs the infusion of speed. Um, and, and Russ, I want to say this to you because look, uh, you know, Miami also has five picks in the first two rounds. I think they have three first round picks, two second round picks. We watched the Seattle Seahawks have four picks in 2019 and turn them into 11 picks, I think, was what they did. So, I mean, I think teams can get crafty, especially when you have that many picks. So he would be a guy I'd be interested in. And we know that players with with elite speed, will, you know, it's yet to be determined for him, have gone earlier in recent years. Um, so I would, you know, so I'd be surprised mm. if he doesn't go maybe a little higher uh, then, then maybe you're projecting. I mean, third round. I think he goes higher than that if he tests well. If he tests really fast, I'd be surprised if a team passes on him. But Russ, let's talk about the dynamic score on this guy for a second. Can we can we talk about the dynamic ability of him? What does that do for you? I mean, what when you look into his profile and you see the rushing yards and you see the kick return yards, does that give you any more hope for the type of playmaker he'll be on the field? Sure. I definitely think um, when you add it all up, there's interesting stuff. Punt return, kick return, rushing yards, kind of what we look for. Um, you know, maybe he is that that Curtis Samuel with a little more oomph mm. type. Um, but, you know, he, I, I, I'm going to have to see that 4-3 yeah. first. 
I'm going to have to see it first. And that's how I'm playing it much more this year. I'm really waiting till athletic testing comes out to, to fully acclimate my takes. But, um, <laughs> uh, he had a really bad situation in TCU with a quarterback in yeah. his final season. And that was and, the other asterisk for sure. For him. Yeah. Right. You can't fully blame him. And I, I think his market share and dominator were still pretty good considering that. So, um, I just know from, from experience, like, Teams are going to look at that 600 receiving yards in his final season, and unless he's Miko Hardman, you know, um, then I, I think he's going to go in the mid second to early third. Russ, type range. I, I heard you mention the phrase market share, and I like got a I got like a tick, I got like a tick, and started developing <laughs> here momentarily because I keep hearing the phrase market share get used when people start talking about Jerry Judy. Why are people overthinking Jerry Judy? I mean, is he not a borderline elite talent? I mean, is this guy not one of the better prospects we've seen in a very long time? Why are we overthinking this guy? Yeah, and again, this is my philosophy. I don't necessarily want to crown myself but once a guy puts up what he did in 2018 i don't really care Bingo. about the rest that's kind of how i i do it and i know you know there was a lot of production in that offense and it wasn't as good from a percentage wise as some people think but when a guy throws for 5,000 yards there's a cap on what percentage a guy can have of that you know, you're not going to get 30% of, exactly. of 5,000 yards. You're just not, you're not going to do that. And, you know, the other factors, his teammates, um, the another factor that I don't think people account for at all with Clemson and Alabama specifically over the last two years is all the blowouts they're in. I mean, these, these players are playing a half. I mean, literally a half. And you want like Devonta Smith, he had that 250 yard and four or five Three or four touchdown. score, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some ridiculous effort, yeah. And that just inflates his entire season um, and, and, and deflates the rest of the supporting cast there. So there's a, so much context in that offense. I also think we're getting much more bunched prospects of late. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a new trend, but it has been cropping up the last couple of years, kind of like, you know, early 2000s uh, Miami. We're seeing that with Ohio State, Clemson, and um, Alabama right now, where they're getting multiple five star rec recruit wide receivers every year. Yeah. Um, and one thing I do not see people addressing in these conversations is how much incumbents matter for college football and how much that affects who gets opportunity in their freshman season. I don't see that being talked about right now. Like I look at a guy like Michael Pittman, how many receiving yards did you want him to have with Juju Smith-Schuster there? Like that's, that's all I'm saying. We can knock him for a sophomore production, but um, in terms of his freshman, it makes sense why he wouldn't produce with Juju there. And then junior, senior year, he had Amon Ross St. Brown, and that's the other end of it where it's like there's other guys coming past him. Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, whatever yeah, his name right. is. Yeah. yeah, you got it. You got yeah, it. Yeah, I got it. And uh, he's coming in five-star recruit, guaranteed playing time, guaranteed, you know, really good prospect. He's probably a first-round guy. And that's why Pittman probably didn't have the prolific production so that you're looking for. So I, there's a lot of context here. I think the base of market share is a great concept, but there's so much more. You so know, bad, you talked yeah. about dynamic score, um, and we're really just breaking into a you know cookout <clears throat> campfire talk about this right now. But like, there's so many factors that go into this, and just looking at you know, receiving yards without looking at it being on Alabama, without looking at it being he played probably, you know, eight quarters <laughs> in 12 games. I mean, that's a huge uh, So, factor. Russ, what you're saying is people that are tweeting this aren't watching the tape because if they were, they would see that Jerry Judy was on the <laughs> sidelines. Here's the thing, Russ. I also hear you yes. saying, without saying, teammate score. I'm hearing teammate score right now because – We've talked about all these situations 
where people are jam-packed on these rosters and they're vying for targets. And like you said, yeah, a team throws for 5,000 yards. It's going to be pretty difficult to have 33% of 5,000 yards. I mean, I don't like you know what we saw with DJ Moore. I don't think that Jerry Judy is going to have you know 45% market share of 5,000 yards. It's the most killer wide receiver, you know, receiver season ever. But I will say, <laughs> for people that are knocking Jerry Judy – and ignoring the sophomore year and killing him for the junior year. You mentioned USC. Let's talk about Juju Smith, right? Remember when he was a sophomore, he had that blowout year. Then his junior season had almost half as many receiving yards, 20 less recep- you know, receptions. And what happened when he got to the NFL? He was a stud. This year, things look a little different. But for the people that were evaluating the exact same way they're doing to Judy, look what happened with, with Juju Smith. Well, and and I want to throw out there, we just went through this with Calvin Ridley, not quite the prospect that um, Judy was, but he's an automatic. Like, if you watched Calvin Ridley play at Alabama, he was automatic. You know, maybe he wasn't a first-round pick. You know, I kind of saw him as a late first-round guy, but he was fantastic. He was clearly going to be a very good receiver, but that stacked. You look at Terry McLaurin, no opportunity his entire career. You know, I look at KJ Hill right now, you know, guy who was at the Senior Bowl. That dude was getting shoved in lockers, and it's like, it's not his fault. He was playing with McLaurin, Paris Campbell, and yeah, you know, studs everywhere. So, yeah, it's, it's, you need to watch the games before you dive into it. And I'm not saying you have to be a film grinder because you don't, because I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm a very amateur film guy, but you have to at least be like, oh, Judy's only playing like they're rotating Jalen Waddle in and, you know, Devonta Smith gets featured in the second half because he's the third wide receiver in the offense. Like that's, it's all really important. We do this, we do this almost annually where there is, I mean, with, without a doubt, it has to happen every year where it's just, it is a player or two that divides the film room and the analytics room, you know, the analytics guys, the number guys, they, all they care about this is numbers. I'm not going to watch any tape. They don't watch Saturdays. They don't care. And then the film guys like, like Rusty kind of hinted at, there's guys that are watching every single rub of every single game. You don't have to be on the extreme of either of those sides. You know, this is, this is what the breakout finder is all about is blending and, and kind of bridging these two worlds and, and bridging the gap here uh, man y- you watch even just a game or two or a rep or two of jerry judy you just see how natural he is man i mean there mm-hmm. this should be one of the more straightforward evaluations i had a tweet uh probably during a sophomore year where i said this guy this guy is going to be better than amari cooper coming out i'm not sure i'm not sure he quite ended up there but but judy to me nate nate kind of asked the question uh before you know this is borderline elite to me judy looks like a pretty special prospect. Um, he's he, he's the one for me, unless he completely falls flat on his face, which I don't think is is in his range of outcomes at the combine. I guess we're gonna have to wait and see. But unless he completely you know blows up and kind of falls off the face of the earth at the combine, I don't see how he doesn't finish as as the one for me. And as as, as Nate kind of hinted at earlier when when he was uh, he went live on Breakout Finder TV, you know Judy's gonna be uh, probably the first wide receiver off the board. He's gonna have the draft capital. He he, he checks all these boxes, um, and I think we're doing all this. Kind we're doing all this tweet and like like we always do every year about a certain player. We're doing it for Judy this year. We're doing all this for nothing. This is like it's a pretty cut and dry evaluation yes, for me. Absolutely. And it's easy. And it's easy. You know, we don't need to it, that's like Calvin Ridley. It it wasn't a hard one. It was like, is he a superstar? Probably not. But is he gonna be very good? Super, super high chance. So yeah, it, it's stuff like that. You know, make it easy on yourself, guys. Um, so don't make us, it hard. Let's shift gears. Right. Let's go from a player that people are thinking about too much to perhaps a player that people aren't thinking about enough. Talk to me about about Brian mm. Edwards out of South Carolina. Yeah. Okay. And this is where this is a guy where breakout age and the market share and that type of stuff and dominator rating can really come in handy because this dude was you know, playing as a 17 year old freshman, super he, young. he, he was really good for all four years. Um, and he's still super young. So that stuff's really valuable with a guy like Brian Edwards. And I, I agree. I don't think, um, he's high enough in rankings right now. We'll see 
about the athletic testing. That's a concern for me. But if he does do all right, I don't need, you know, a super athlete. I just need 50th, 60th percentile for him. Uh, he's a big boy. Um, I like how he was used on screens. Again, really bad quarterback play. If there's one reason to watch college football, it's to judge the quarterback play. It, and some of these are really, really struggling, man. And um, sometimes they're on their third string guy by week six. And then you're like, oh, but he fell off in the second half. Well, sometimes Alex ah. Horny Brook happens. And shout out, <laughs> shout out to Maury and Terry. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't got a ton to add. Edwards feels like a guy that's being slept on. Um, I say that kind of with a bit of an asterisk because, uh, as Rusty kind of kind of hinted at, you know, the the analytics guys are having a field day with Edwards. He is uh, he's one of their you know crown princes right now. Mm. Uh, the breakout age, all all that stuff, all the numbers are screaming towards Brian Edwards. So you so you you see a lot of you know Brian Edwards, you know wide receiver two, wide receiver three in this class. I'm not quite that high on him. Um, I. I I will say I do have my initial pre-combine top 25 rankings coming out on Friday, the Breakout mm-hmm. Finder Patreon, and I got um, I got Edwards. I want to say at wide receiver seven, so I am I am nice. fairly high. I am fairly high on him. That that feels like a pretty good range uh, yep. for him. I am kind of holding off until we get to testing. Of course, I'm not sure how great he's going to be there. I do expect uh, I do I do expect some pretty solid results. I mean, again, you watch him, you watch his ability just to get up and go get it, and he looks like an athletic enough dude. Uh, so I'll be curious to see kind of where, where he checks in with that. But, uh, yeah, a player that um, maybe maybe the film grinders, so to speak, haven't gotten around to yet. Um, and, you know, they're, they're going to be playing catch up a little bit. But but a player that I think is going to, you know, over time as we walk through the combine, all this stuff is going to kind of correct Ryan, for himself. Ryan, my pants so. are, are pretty tight. Can you mention again when your top 25 is dropping <laughs> on Patreon? I just talked to my water a little bit. Bro, oh my. Friday, oh my. 8 a.m. Let's go. Let's get after it, bro. This is this is Nate. This Woo! is this is our time of year, Boy, buddy. They are super tight. All right, so let's move to the uh, <laughs> next most important question here. I mean, Brian Edwards kind of fits the bill on this next question, but Russ, if it's possible, is there an under the radar prospect in 2020? And if so, is it a wide receiver? Is it a running back? Is there somebody that has caught your eye? that you want to cape up for right now or you want to put uh, the spotlight on? I, I want to cape up oh, for being it. reasonable. Wow, sensible. You know? <laughs> let's, let's cape up for having rankings that might look similar to everyone else's, maybe some minor adjustments. In None 2020, of that None of that um, that's, that's how I've been doing things for the last couple years. I mean, generally speaking, um, I'm going to have some differences with everyone else, and I'm going to be higher on guys than consensus all over the board. But it's not going to be drastic. I think in 2020, the book's out. You're not going to have, you're not going to be writing about a sleeper that nobody knows about. Right. Um, in 2020, I, I will say Darius Anderson from TCU interested me um, this year. He had a few games with 20 touches, looked pretty good, looked good at the senior ball. So I'll be interested how he tests out. But nah, I, I, I'm not into that. I don't care. You know, you can be higher on me than everyone. Someone in the industry is going to be higher than than me on every prospect and I've just accepted that and I'll take my lukewarm takes home with me and eat them and enjoy them. And that's how I win. That's I, how I, I win. I threw, I threw this question out here with the, with the idea that as, as Rusty kind of hit on, you know, it's 2020, uh, social media timeline, everything, all this stuff, everyone has access mm-hmm. to pretty much everything. Uh, I just, I personally, uh, this is my way of kind of saying this is like, I find it funny when, you know, every, every, every day you log on every, every other day you log on and someone inevitably is tweeting about, man, boy, oh boy, we're not talking enough about player a like, bro. Like there's, everyone's talking about every player. Like, <laughs> you know, it's not like, we're not, there's no shade or there's nothing like nothing. There's no one that's like right. hidden from the 
eye or like everyone's got a take on everybody you know like so i i just think it's funny when like you know someone's got a someone's got an opinion oh when we need to spend more time talking about yeah we probably talked about him ad nauseum like three weeks ago you 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 didn't you didn't log on that that day we were talking about joshua kelly or whatever so um it's it's, it's all fun in the process man and i'm i'm uh you know our our guy friend friend of the show or, or someone that i hope to be a friend of the show Fusu View dropped his his initial top fifteen today, and he's always good. He is he is Nate. Nate talks about being a champion, man. F- Fusu View is a champion of takes, and uh, and and inevitably his uh, and I we talked pre show. I always go out of my way to no matter what I'm doing. If Nate texted me and said, "Dude, life's your cup, just drop." just drop the heat i will i will walk out of the office just to retweet his shit so it gets on the timeline and more and more eyes get exposed too because my, my man's mentions have to be one of the sloppiest ones on, on twitter.com <laughs> let me let me throw out there that man is a hero and i appreciate what I appreciate he does him. I appreciate and if, him. if that's your role and that's what you're that's what you're gonna be then i respect that role that you're gonna play um I'm just not that uh, guy. I because guess. Russ, like you said, you're <laughs> sensible. Look, it's not sensible to have Jerry Judy ranked as the wide receiver 29 in a draft class with 52 <laughs> eligible wide receivers. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But you know what? <laughs> to each their own. Sure, I can't find Ceedee Lamb on his list. Life should, life should cut, man. Do not change. Who's with you? Do not Content change. Right. Machine. All right, Russ. I'm going to pick through a couple of these here, and then we're going to get to uh, some extracurricular questions here that got added onto the show sheet. I don't Mm. know if you were prepared for them or not. Uh, You can tell they're in purple. But here's a name that got a bunch of shine at the Senior Bowl, uh, Denzel Mims. Uh, Ryan just wrote about him because Ryan loves every player that's ever played at Baylor that's taller than six feet. Love them all. Um, Love them all. You 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 got Baylor on your helmet. I'm I'm loving you. I'm drafting you. I want you on my team. It's a sickness, and I've had it, and I'm trying to problem. get over it this it's year. Talk to it me, is. Russ Denzel Mims. Is there is there anything here? Uh, is it is it all hype? Is he a player that is just going to be a great value um, in, in the middle rounds of the NFL draft? And is he the type of guy that you're targeting uh, in like the second round of a dynasty draft? He's interesting. Um, again, no, no rushing, no special teams, purely sort of that deep threat archetype. Um, really, really nice 2017 season. And I was really bummed out. He didn't declare after his junior year. Um, it's sort of, it's a weird evaluation and I need athletic testing. I'm, I'm holding out for right now. If he runs a four, four or something like that, um, I'd be willing to bump him. Like I do, I do see him as a higher end guy than say a Hakeem Butler. Oh. So I kind of see God. Mims. Oh, hold, on, hold, okay on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not, I'm not okay with. Hold him. on. Okay, Hakeem Butler, fourth round pick last year, right? Um, I I see Mims as sort of a deep threat archetype, and I don't see him going in the first two rounds. So I see him in that third, fourth round range right now, just based on. Um, you know, his production profile, if that's the case, um, you know, it's going to be hit or miss for him. And that's where I'm at. I feel like he's a high ceiling, low floor guy. Go ahead. Matt Kelly boots boots on the ground. He was at mobile with the roster watch crew and he, he had a couple tweets about Denzel Mims, someone mm. that surprised him. Um, and I think his analysis, uh, Matt Kelly's analysis of Mims was, was pretty spot on. I think naturally in rookie drafts, he's going to get pushed down the board, just given the, you know, the abundance of wide receiver talent above him. Um, but he's shaping up to be a pretty solid, you know, kind of early second round uh, pick again. If he checks those athletic boxes, he has a track background. Um, yeah. Wasn't a highly, wasn't a highly, a highly touted recruit. The only the two or three, Three star kid, but again, track background. So I think speed um, is there. That that that's kind of what these Baylor wide receivers do, right? They're all long, they're all fast. Um, they all can go up and get it, and run down the field, run past, run past coverage. So I think yeah, I think he's gonna I think he's gonna be you know on par with what people are expecting testing wise, and that's gonna kind of you know keep padding that floor. So um, yeah, I, I I to answer Nate's Nate's question is uh, I, I I do like him in that in that second round or so right now in dynasty drafts, and we'll see kind of how things shift over so, the next couple months. Russ, these this player here is not going to be a value. Mm, Not going to be a value because everybody knows who he is. Everybody's a fan of the talent. Um, But DeAndre Swift, is he easily the RB1 
Uh, are you a Jonathan Taylor fan? Where where are you on this line? Shout out home and oh, home yeah, improvement, right? right? <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay uh, that thanks, was really that, that was a great thanks. moment I well really, done thanks, really well appreciated done. that um jonathan taylor has the seventh most yards from mm. scrimmage all time and he only played three mm-hmm. seasons of college football so crazy um so, he averaged sound, sounds okay he averaged 2000 like 2050 yards from scrimmage a season and he is incredible and i don't know how anyone could be the easy rb1 when he's in this draft class Mm. unless it's him um i i'm confused by swift a little bit i think he's a very good prospect uh but i don't see the todd Gurley. i don't see the saquon i don't see the um you know like lightning incredible uh once every few years guy so i think he's really good he's probably better than josh jacobs um i i think he will be but um it's it's tough right now he's right in that tier really good but i think i have taylor as my rb1 right now and i had etn Mm. above swift as well oh wait yeah, dude. The, the the thing with Swift is, uh, I think I think it's kind of take locky. People are kind of people are kind of entrenched with him. You know, he's been he, he's he's been a Devi you know favorite sure. for a while. You know, siphoning touches from these highly touted, highly talented you know Georgia backs. You know, Swift was always next up, and now you know he had the whole show to himself. So yeah, people had him as that R, as that RB one all along. They're not going to necessarily kind of pivot off of that now. No so. need to. No yeah, need to. you know. So, but I mean that. But that's the thing though when. People throw out again. This was I, I wrote this up because this was a real tweet by by someone who's uh, fairly respected in the community as far as you know. Oh, Swift is easy the RB one. I'm like, I don't know how you can make that claim yeah. when you're looking at guys like Dobbins. When you're looking at guys like mm-hmm. Taylor, that that mm-hmm. certainly um, if they're not the one, they're they're easily in that conversation for me. So uh, yeah, again, yeah. Taylor's Taylor's my one as well. I believe Nate's uh, in lockstep uh, with, with that. So just a really good class at the top, man. But I don't think I don't think Swift's easy. You know anything? Here, as, as here's far what as semi concerned. concerns me about Jonathan Taylor, Thomas, and Russ. I want you to, to give me your take on this because this doesn't come up enough, I think. And we've seen it with some other players, Royce Freeman, namely another guy. Are you concerned with the fact that Jonathan Taylor has 926 rushing attempts in his college career? I mean that that guy has has done. 300 more rush attempts than Melvin Gordon or Leonard Fournette or numerous other running backs that have entered the college ranks. I mean, do you, do you buy into the tread on the tires argument or are, are we not concerned at all? I, I like, I like a little tread on the tires. I like a work, work them in for me. Um, yeah. So that was kind of getting a little too sexual yeah, so and I'm much. sorry about that, but, um, <laughs> That's not how I meant that to go. But what I'm saying is, if you look up the all-time yards from scrimmage leaders in college football history, you're going to get a lot of Hall of Fame running backs in the NFL, and that's all I needed to know. You know, I don't really care about tread on the tires. Major injuries is what I care about. The fact that he went through all those touches and barely he missed like one game and he was banged yeah. up for another in his final season. Other than that, I mean – pristine health so yeah no no concerns there it's honestly probably a you know what man you're you're a straight shooter you don't pull punches you don't play around and that's what we like about you when you come on here and we have reached the point in the show russ where we are going to answer some patron questions and to the listening growing audience of this show if you want to get your question answered live on the show by fantastically handsome, well-versed individuals like Russell, Jay, look at him, man. Clay, look at him. Just, just look at him. Then go to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash breakout finder. Uh, you know, find the tier that works for you. We're offering a lot of good extras. Ryan and I are doing a once a month, uh, anything goes YouTube live stream where you guys can ask us questions. Uh, you guys need marital advice. I'm your guy. You need uh, closet <laughs> rearrangement questions. Uh, Ryan's your guy. If you need a racquetball trainer, maybe Russ could be your guy. But listen, go on there. We've got a cool T-shirt perk and a lot of really fun stuff going on. And we love when people support the show. So here we go. This one is from Rhett. This is the first 
No fantastic name. Football question we have gotten, and I am just so excited about it. Russ, favorite TV show all time. Ooh. Oh. Okay. Give it to us. All right. Give it to us. So, if I'm being all right, we're doing. Do we want Russ rankings or or Fuzu oh, rankings? No, <laughs> I want I want Russ rankings. Please. Oh well, yeah. Give us give us the. Give so the, the reasonable. Give us the all right, reasonable. I gotta say, the first six seasons of Game of Thrones was probably the best television I've ever seen. Um, and I'd also throw Mad Men in there. Um, but my my personal favorite is Boardwalk Empire. Um, I think that is. I just love the the gangster, the guy who did Al Capone, Stephen Graham. Incredible performance. Um, just so many good performances, so many good actors in that show. Mm, All yeah. in. I feel like Gra- Graham always pops up in like these little ancillary type. type yes. Roles the but but he but he's solid, dude. Solid. Yeah. Definitely de- definitely loved him as Pacino. I'm gonna go. Um, it, it was close and even and Nate, we've talked a lot about the ending of Game of Thrones and all this stuff. Even with all this aside, uh, Thrones has to be up there. Even like Rusty said, for the first six seasons, just literally perfect television. Yeah. Um, it might be one A, one B for me with like a with like a wire wire. The first time Ooh. I watched the first time through was um, again. Arg- and again, this is a this is a show that there's legit. There was or still is, you know, Harvard type courses on just ba- just Baltimore and the streets and all this stuff man so just what uh what 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 the wire did um just just huge just uh, enormous so so I'm, I'm i'm all in on the wire all in on all in on game of thrones um it's kind of like a 1a 1 1b type it. situation Look, man uh i'm with you i'm gonna go ahead and say game of thrones you know i was uh let down significantly in the final season i understand why but ever since that show yeah, when I cook sausages, I always ask my wife how many Theon Greyjoys do you want? Do you want one? Or do you want two? So we have this great. If for nothing thing. else, that's why it's the one. Do you do you do wriggle you, it at her uh, yeah, when it's almost done? I gotta show like, how fork. much elasticity is in it so we know if it's ready to eat. So, oh wow, that that now that was too. Sexual, that is right? absolutely so, disgusting. All right, here's another question for you. My goodness, talk about heaping praise on this guy. So this comes from Jay. And I kind of feel like there's maybe a type one one here, so I'm going to try to stumble through this. But it says, during the 2019 rookie draft, Russell implored people to trade up for A.J. Brown. I traded Jarvis Landry to get him. So my question is, what is it like being so smart and so handsome, Russ? (laughs) Mm. Mm. Oh, this tastes good. I'm going to drink it in. I will say, you know, like – I, I'm a pretty, pretty measured guy, and I'm quick to recognize my boss. This was one of my better takes. This was, this was up there. Um, this one, you this know, one, this, this one definitely we, felt good for you. We die on Corey Coleman Hill so we can oh, have AJ so Browns, and and this was a sweet, a sweet, sweet call for me. Um, well yeah, well I, I was I was really happy about it. The post draft Tennessee stock down was one of the best times. I mean, you know, I put out a tweet that AJ Brown was going in second rounds of rookie drafts and that got a lot of people really angry. Um, I I didn't mean every rookie draft, but there were <laughs> people. People took a personal offense to that. There, there were people who reached out to me, fantasy guru people who were getting him, and they were like, "What should I do? He's here at two oh four, and uh, you know uh, that to the victor goes the spoils." Absolutely, well Russ. Well here's, done, a, Russell. here's another one for you. This one comes from Duke. How likely? Are the Indianapolis Colts to bring in additional running back mm. competition for Marlon Mack from the draft or through free agency? Yeah, so in terms of Marlon Mack, he's kind of taking that similar um, career path to many fourth round running backs we've seen over the last decade. They start out, have a pretty good rookie year. He really broke out second year, um, and we're gonna we're starting to see a little regression. I, I think that injury this year could could put up some red flags for his future. Obviously, a talented guy. It's not that. It's just you know over decades we've seen 
teams that don't invest top three round picks into players are quick to move on when there's anything going wrong. Mm. So I don't think he'll be replaced, but um, he could have some competition. Although they seem to be playing it pretty smart. It seems like they like Naeem Hines. Um, if they pick a guy in the third round, Absolutely. we could be in trouble. Russ with that cold, cold water on Marlon Mack. So last question <laughs> of the show, Russ. Um, this one comes from Charlie. And it reads... Mm. Has Miko Hardman flashed enough upside to be worth an early 2020 second round rookie pick? Mm. Absolutely. Um, I would definitely pay a 2020 second. I'm looking at Patrick Mahomes as Peyton Manning right now. Um, I'm, I view every player that goes there as gold until proven otherwise. Um, second round pick, elite athlete, well, elite elite um mm-hmm. speed at least Speedster, yeah, they sure. they used him they really liked him on that kick return this year and punt return which you know you can tell they like him and they're using him in fun ways i i can't wait to see if his role grows if they let go of sammy watkins and they kind of bring in some type of slot guy um i think it's going to be hill and hardman on the outside next year and that is horrifying for everyone so it's um yeah, healthy Mahomes probably going for forty plus touchdowns every year My from God, now on. Russ. So, Russ, you yeah. just absolutely you know, you know propelled Miko Hardman's ADP. You did it right there. There, there we Let's go. go. Nobody baby. can afford him. Dude, Russ is a needle absolutely. mover. Absolutely. So, hey, Russ, uh, what, what, where can people find you? What do you want to plug? What are you doing over at Guru? Uh, let the people know. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm at Fantasy Guru right now. We just kicked off our off-season sort of package here. Um, I'm basically the dynasty guy there, but we got, you know, Tyler Buker, Armando Marcel, and Jeff Manns kind of, you know, plugging away here. We got XFL content coming. I'm I'm actually pretty excited about that. Kind of hopeful some some underclassmen kind of make the wave and are like, oh, yeah, I want to make money before I go to the NFL. So I'm hoping that happens for for the college kids' sake, and uh, we're going to be covering that and uh, having a lot of fun over there. So, you know, you guys provide some excellent dynasty content, but uh, if you're looking to switch it up for, like, XFL and we got fantasy baseball as well starting to kick off, Vlad Selder's really, really sharp dude, so... Um, come, come and get it. Come and get it. I like it. I like it. That's a little. That's a. That, that's a little tease there, bro. Absolutely. Come and get it, Russ. Yeah. Man, the, I like the that. Pied Piper just bringing them in. Bring them right in the door. Yeah, people. If you don't already <laughs> follow Russell Clay, I would be surprised again at Russell J Clay on Twitter. Uh, a goat in his own right, and uh, one of the originators of the Breakout Finder, man. So uh, always a good time bringing you back on the show, bringing you back to your roots, man. Um, you know, cause I feel like we're, uh, I feel like we're living, we're living something, uh, you know, that, that never, that never turned into, to the, to the flower that we thought it was going to be, but it's nice to, uh, kind of live sort of, uh, semi vicariously through one another, uh, in these moments. And, and my guy Ryan over here, uh, has become like the, the shining beacon of hope, uh, for the breakout finder, Debbie extraordinaire. Mm. And again, Ryan, <laughs> what day are you dropping something? Hmm. Boys, Friday, Dang. this Friday, which is what the hell is what the hell is this Friday, the thirty first, eight a.m. Patreon.com slash breakout finder. I love it, man. Come get it. Come, come and, like come and get says, it. Come Absolutely. and get it. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, listening, and we will be back next week. Uh, see you guys later.